Thank you all. It's a pleasure to join you again. I so enjoy returning to Villanova where I have spent some delightful hours in conversation with faculty, fellows, and students. And we've discussed a vast range of topics over the course of these past 15 or 20 years. Uh, but we've never quite focused as we are today on this particular topic, uh, which comes into focus precisely because of the publication last spring of this book, The State of Black America. And what I want to do is to be able to entertain questions about it, primarily, and therefore have but a few words to say at the outset by way of introduction. Uh, the question I have been most frequently asked uh, when appearing on uh, programs discussing the book, whether podcasts or television or radio is, why did you publish this book? <laughs> it would be easy to say because I'm in the book publishing business. <laughs> That's what I've been doing my whole life. But it would be far more pertinent to say that uh, we published this book because we were hugely sensitive to the fact that there is a rather anemic conversation that takes place around the question of race in the United States. And this book was published under the sponsorship of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, which I served for a short period as the chief operating officer. And it brought this project to fruition in that role, precisely to be able to address, not only in my own name, but in the name of the assembled scholars who contributed to this edition, the underlying foundations of this national conversation, which seems to have gone nowhere for a very long period of time. Or perhaps that's the wrong thing to say, to say that it's gone nowhere. Say it's gone from bad to worse consistently. So it seems appropriate to step back and reflect upon why it is we're in such a state. Therefore, what we've done is to assemble a set of essays which present historical perspective as well as a contemporary analysis of the state of the conversation. And by historical perspective, I mean, of course, most fundamentally, what has transpired since the advent of the Civil War and, of course, the period following, through which, despite emancipation, the country has struggled to find a secure footing upon which to address the question of citizenship. For ultimately, as the book is at pains to point out, the underlying question is not the question of race, but the meaning of citizenship itself. And one of the things that I have been at great pains to emphasize in the two essays I contributed to the volume is that the question of citizenship will never be resolved in the United States until we resolve the question of race. Now, you will find an elaborate discussion of that in the first essay that I contributed yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and also in the essay on competing visions. Uh, what distinguishes the two essays is that the first essay means to give an accurate portrait of where we have been and what we have become, whereas the second essay is addressed to the question of what is the chief argument that is opposed to the argument I have developed in the course of this book, namely that we stand at a point at which we cannot resolve this issue without abandoning the question of race itself and bringing the question of citizenship and the allied question of patriotism to the fore. Hence, I conclude in my presentation that it is not simply the state or condition of black people in the United States that is the topic of conversation. It is the question of the fate of the United States itself. And I even go so far as to say that unless a foundation for black patriotism emerges, which is to say full citizenship, there cannot be any salvation for the United States. So that is the broad picture which is presented in this book with a great deal of rich detail I'm only going to mention one of those, and then I'm going to sit down and we'll have our conversation. Uh, that, that one detail goes back to the presentation of Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass in 1893 at the time of the Columbian Exposition. 
that was the great Chicago World's Fair of that year. <coughs> Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass published a pamphlet entitled The Reason Why. And it had that title because its burden was to explain and to complain that black people were left out of that World's Fair. And the underlying strength of their argument inhered almost completely in the claim that what had happened post-slavery in the United States was testimony to the power of the United States to work renewal and reform. And that leaving black citizens out of the World's Fair was hiding the achievements of the United States itself. And it is, of course, true that Wells and Douglas wished to see the achievements of America's black citizens highlighted, for there was much to highlight and much to be quite proud of. Uh, contrary to ordinary expectations, though the formerly enslaved not only were not slow in embracing the challenge of citizenship, but remarkably successful initially in embracing the challenge of citizenship. So Wells and Douglas's argument was that you are effectively denying the dramatic evidence of how powerful freedom is and how powerful the underlying promise of the United States is by excluding black people from the world's fair. Now that argument is essentially the, the argument that I'm making when I make the argument about the necessity of black patriotism in order to save the United States. So let's have a conversation about that. Thank you for those. Uh, it's not the subtitle of the book, but I noticed that on the cover it says that in the 21st century it is dangerous to ask the wrong questions about the state of black America. So we're going to be living dangerously today, I think. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, first, the first chapter of the book, uh, uh, which is an essay by you and uh, Mikhail, um, Mikhail Good, um, is an interesting sort of... Uh, survey, I think, of, of what a lot of people, social scientists and political scientists, think about America today. And it starts from the observation that all discussion of race in America today begins with the unchallengeable a priori, that America is a systemically racist country. Right? Um, and it's unchallengeable for two reasons. Right? And one is that it's just uh, it's very dangerous to challenge it. Uh, and the second reason is it's uh, unchallengeable is because it's taken to be self-evident. And if you ask what the evidence for the self-evidence is, uh, you know, you're pointed to immediately to, to statistical disparities. So that's everything from life expectancy and health outcomes, educational attainment, incarceration, relative economic status, relative political leverage, um, uh, and so on. And there are, there are disparities. Uh, uh, as an example of somebody who accepts this kind of analysis, you, you bring forward uh, Robert Putnam to begin with, who's famous for his, his book, Bowling Alone. Uh, and Putnam gives, uh, you know, he's talking about all of America and America's problems, but one chapter is devoted to race. And his take on it, very simply, is that for a long time in America, things were improving. Right? Uh, from the 1890s up until maybe 1965, something like that, uh, the story was one of real progress uh, in all sorts of ways. But then in 1965, uh, the upswing turned into a massive downswing, and, and, and in measurable ways, life outcomes for black Americans turned worse. Uh, his conclusion about that is that America took its foot off the gas, in the way that he put it. And his uh, prescription then is that we need to put our foot back on the gas, right? which presumably means something like uh, we need to formulate government social policies and reforms that would get us back to being a more communitarian society or so, something like that, to try to use his language. You clearly feel that, that, um, that his interpretation of the data is not the right interpretation, right? That it's, uh, that it's under, it, that it's missing some important areas of black flourishing, number one. Uh, and that number two, uh, that it does not justify a conclusion that America is systemically racist. So can I ask you to walk us through your reasoning for this, not to go too deeply into the weeds, but just walk us through why, if, if, you're, if there are serious disparities, Right, in the outcomes, why isn't that prima facie evidence of, of a systemically racist 
country? Excellent question, and of course it goes to the heart of the matter. The reality is that as we review the literal facts, the picture that emerges, causally speaking, is the opposite of what we assume. Uh, we assume that picture because of certain influences that have been prevalent, particularly since the 1930s, that have led us to close our eyes to the manifest evidence of progress and to depend instead on a narrative of intervention as the only foundation for progress. So what I've done in the book is to show that when Putnam's upswing, and that's the title of this book, uh, his upswing, which shows the enormous progress that was being made in the first half of the 20th century, abstracts from the fact that that progress was made in the face of enormous resistance. I mean, that was, of course, the era that opened with massive lynchings, with the adoption, formally, of Jim Crow, of enforced segregation. Uh, that was the era in which we saw uh, I would almost use the word rampant, uh, violent rioting in communities from uh, Charleston, Atlanta, to Tulsa, and elsewhere around the United States. So, so that to observe that there was an upswing in the face of that only gives testimony to the resilience of black communities, not the opposite. And it's not to say that there was not racism, of course there was and always will be racism with a small r. But racism with a capital R, which is what is meant by systemic racism, doesn't exist, and I would submit cannot exist. So the question is, how are we supposed to navigate these waters where we have seen the perils people faced at the outset of the 20th century, and now that we've come into the beginning of the 21st century, to orient our thinking in such a way as to have confidence that people can prevail in the face of obstacles. And I use a concrete example from Selma, Alabama in the course of that discussion. I had gone there in 2018 when I was doing a survey of civil rights memorials throughout the South with a group, a busload of 45 teachers. And of course, Selma is one of the places we stopped because that's where in 1963, the very famous march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge took place. And that was in the struggle for voting rights in the state of Alabama, a subject I'll come back to in an interesting way in a moment. But as we were gathering in Big Bethel AME Church there in Selma, which is where the uh, protesters had gathered to strategize before marching across the bridge, I was delivering a lecture to the teachers about that event and its significance. And in the middle of my lecture, I stopped cold, fell silent, and looked up and around me. And then I turned back to the group of teachers and I asked the question, who do you suppose built this? There was silence that greeted the question because of course it was unanticipated and came out of the blue. But it wasn't long before people finally said, well, of course, the people who worshipped here. And to which I said, right, of course, and who were they? They were an entirely black congregation in the heart of Alabama, where resistance was at its stoutest. Now, the reason that's important is because that particular structure is absolutely gorgeous. It is an example of extraordinary architectural creativity. It is a testimony to the resources that community brought to bear in their own lives, on their own circumstances which is to say they were not cowered in hopeless, helpless, submissive fear. They were still living their lives even though subject to lynchings and all kinds of repressions all around them. And so what Putnam was missing was the strength of agency in black communities even in the worst possible circumstances. Now to miss that is to miss the reason for the upswing. It didn't occur because government sponsorship lifted the formerly enslaved into the state of freedom. It occurred because the formerly enslaved enlisted themselves. A similar illustration of that principle occurs when we revert to what Justice Earl Warren said in Brown versus Board of Education in justification of the decision striking down separate but equal in education.
he had one phrase, one pregnant phrase, which underscored all that he had to say in that particular opinion. Namely, that at the end of slavery, virtually all the formerly enslaved were illiterate. By which he meant, therefore, to say, they were not in a position to do for themselves. And unless we undertake to do it for them, it won't get done. He had extracted completely from just how extraordinarily quickly the rate of literacy expanded in the immediate aftermath of slavery, such that by 1920 already it had achieved a 50% level and was well on its way to that well before the beginning of the 20th century. The launching of the school movement was indigenous. It was not imposed from without. The reaching for education was the instinctive response of the formerly enslaved to their own opportunity as it arose. So what I'm saying is there's been a great abstraction from the powers that the people themselves brought to their circumstances that generated what he called an upswing, that generated progress and improvement. We saw family formation take place at an extraordinary rate in that same period. People who had been going through forced family separations, and in some cases even forbidden to form families, who had been abused and even brutalized by slavery, nevertheless took instantly to family formation and building the strength of families and communities in the immediate aftermath of slavery. All of these examples I give you were examples of the emergent resilience and strength of black communities all of which have been effaced from our memories, memories by the constant reframing of the so-called legacy of slavery that hobbles black people. So the argument that I presented is this, and I show that it emerges from Putnam's own statistics. I don't have to introduce new statistics. I do add some census facts which he ignored, but I show that what his statistics demonstrate is precisely that the path to progress was indigenous agency in black communities. And only insofar as that has come to be repressed have we fallen since 1965 into this desuetude of imagining that we cannot dispel disparities. So a final example to make it contemporary so you understand completely what I'm talking about. We have been presented ever since the pandemic with one very dramatic evidence of disparity. It has been said, until today, not now it's different and there's no explanation for it, that the pandemic disproportionately killed black people. And that that was evidence of systemic racism in America. That's why black people were exposed to it, because of racism. Well, uh, there's a case that any ordinary intelligence can figure out very readily. Namely, that it wasn't, in fact, systemic racism from the point of view of people targeting black people. It was the concentration of black people in government-subsidized nursing homes that led to the disproportionate deaths of black people in the pandemic. That's where the deaths spread virally. And the people who were on Medicaid and in those confined facilities suffered from it. So that the very governmental programs, which are boasted as bringing relief to an oppressed community, became the agency which affected that community at a disparate rate. So it's not an accident that today, if you check the statistics, you will see that that disparity has reversed. And now it is more non-blacks who die from COVID than black people. And so you ask, well, why would that have happened? because they saw what was happening in the nursing homes and people forcing people into nursing homes and they stopped it. They cleaned it up. It's better now than it was. But it wasn't because the country was systemically racist, it's because it was purblind. It was doing things that had consequences to which people had given no real thought, but to which it would have been easy to have given thought if you had been minded to do so. So it means that we need to be able to look at the landscape of policy and social development through a differing lens if we want to be able to understand the dynamics that are affecting people.
That's the point of the analysis. Uh, the, uh, the second political scientist that you uh, talk about in, in that first chapter, uh, Richard Alba, uh, uh, from the City University of New York, who wrote a book called The Great Demographic Illusion, uh, starts out by asking, why are American blacks still excluded from the we of American society? Uh, and begins his book really by saying, well, no, they're not. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and he argues that, again, this is something that has been seriously misrepresented. Uh, by the by, the statistics, uh, in part because, if I understand the argument correctly, the statistics are not taking account of intermarriage, among other things. Uh, and that uh, gives rise to what I think is probably the most controversial passage in a controversial book. So I want to read it. <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's a, a statement uh, about where you see America headed uh, in, terms of, in terms of intermarriage. And uh, it's, a, it's a longish paragraph, but I, I'm going to read it. Uh, a first glance at the great demographic illusion might tempt a reader to imagine an approaching end of the familiar distinctions of black and non-black Americans. The highlighted significance of an increasingly multiracial society ultimately implies a no-racial society, or perhaps we should say no races. We believe, however, that reading to be an oversimplification and by no means the most challenging reading. Rather, we shall submit the implication is that with regard to colors, a general fusion shall occur along lines of general paleness, that for reason of mere chemistry. Or seeming white is all there is to being white, exclamation point. More importantly, however, what shall emerge is a form of national identification that will completely absorb all in the embrace of the European tradition, a thing that has not yet occurred. We repeat, as we said above, that that is a life of politics above culture in which ties of blood, tribe, and religion will play no role in sorting power. In such a world in which the individual must stand on character and accomplishment to advance, it may, and it and likely shall, still be prominent that communitarian values will rise and fall with political platforms. If that is to happen, however, it will have to be without the crutch of race or other non-relevant group identifications. In other words, a world in which the individual alone counts is not, for all that, a world in which individualism uh, alone counts. Um, if I'm reading you correctly, and, and please correct me if I'm not, um, you're saying two things. Uh, one, this is going to happen, and two, that it should happen, which is to say that race is going to vanish from our national consciousness as something important. We are, uh, would, it, would it be correct to conclude that you're saying we will see more and more intermarriage? Uh, and to the point where, in however long it takes, however many hundreds of years, people will stop caring. Yes, it is correct to say that, and, and I am even more emphatic. I, I say that it is not going to happen, but it is happening very rapidly, and we are willfully refusing to acknowledge it. That this great absorptive process is taking place in the valleys. At the opening of that chapter, I distinguish between the perspective from the mountaintop and the perspective from the valley. And, and what I'm arguing is that at the mountaintops, people think everything in the valley is static. But in fact, the valley is a region of great ferment. Things are changing rapidly and without being subject to the overruling authority of those who hold the mountaintop view. So that the greatest changes in terms of intermixing are taking place not in the elite uh, cadres of society. It happens there, of course. But it's actually happening at the very bottom of the society, more dramatically than anywhere else. You see it everywhere, including throughout the southern United States. That, in fact, this chemistry that I'm talking about, this chemical experiment, you, everybody knows what it means to create a solution, right? You take a solvent and a solute. Okay, I got some chemistry students here somewhere. <laughs> you bring them together. <laughs> what you get is going to be different from either, right? Uh, but it will show, doubtlessly, some of the characteristics of each of the elements entering into the solution. But the whole point of the solution is absorption. That's what's happening to this country with regard to differences of color. I'm often moved to reflect when I hear people talk about BIPOCs, to wonder what on earth they're talking about. I mean, I know what the words, what the letters symbolize, so black, indigenous, people of color. But I'm always stopped when I get to the people of color part because I say, I don't know any people without color. So 
what are people of color? It's not everybody. So we're using these terms euphemistically. We're using them as political slogans not to describe reality. If we were to confine ourselves to describing reality, we would be forced to acknowledge that we're seeing a rapid change take place before our eyes, which means all of that long discourse which started somewhere in the 1980s and reached this crescendo towards the end of the 2010 era of an emerging majority of minorities in America, it's utter nonsense. It's not going to be any majority of minorities, which means discrete, separate formations, easily distinguishable and visible. No, it's going to be a great absorption that takes place. And so what will be the majority is not going to be some distinct color. It is going to be the effacing of color as a point of reference. That is our future, and it is rapidly approaching. And the most important question is whether we are prepared to embrace that future for what it signifies. One of the striking uh, uh, things you say in that paragraph, one of, one of several striking things, is that it's going to be a European society. I do say that it's going to be a European society. I need to explain that. I, I, <laughs> I think people may misunderstand that because they're accustomed to, when they hear European, they're thinking white and even Anglo-Saxon or Protestant or some such thing. That, that's not what I, the reference at all. I, I'm making this reference in historical terms of how the human race has changed particularly since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. For what the Treaty of Westphalia signifies is the emergence of the nation state as the principal form of social organization. The nation state replaced tribes and it replaced bloodlines as the basis for the formation of communities, established only political sovereignty as a defining characteristic of communities. And in doing so, created a standard for the world which has become universal. It is hard for people to wrap their minds around this, but people did not live in nation states before 1648. There was no such thing. You had great empires, the Roman Empire, everybody remembers the Roman. It was not a nation state. You had city states, you had tribes, you had loosely communal organizations of society, almost all of which were structured in accord with certain principles primarily of blood, but also of religion and similar kinds of things. Well, all of that got wiped out once the nation state came to have the authoritative position in terms of social organization, with the consequence that every society on the face of the earth today is organized as a nation state. That is the European system. That is what I'm referring to when I say we become thoroughly European. And the reason that is important is because many of those who are arguing polemically against the political system in the United States, and they often refer to it as a European system, mean to overturn that system itself without reflecting on what the implications are for the existence of the nation state as such. And I'm submitting no one is going to overturn the nation state. They may quibble about whether it's going to be organized economically around socialist lines or capitalist lines or any number of other such things, but they're all going to be confined to operating on principles of national sovereignty. And they're going to interact, these various states, with one another on the basis of negotiating transactions in terms of national sovereignty. They're going to, well, let us just pause and reflect on what's at stake and what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Why is the world reacting in the way it's reacting to what's happening in Ukraine? Because it challenges the idea that the nation state as such is reified, it is rigid, it is not to be in any way compromised. And so the era of aggressive expansion has come to an end. It was to have come to an end, of course, with the defeat of Nazi Germany. 
but then there emerged the threat of communist Soviet subjection as a lingering challenge, which itself was overthrown ultimately when all of the satellite states to the Soviet Union were liberated at the beginning of the 1990s, end of the 1980s. So that what was being cemented in that process was the enduring significance and authority of the nation state, the European system. It emerged in Europe and spread throughout the globe. That is the status on which all human life will subsist hereafter. Now, in that respect, the United States as a nation state must be understood primarily not in terms of cultural background, but in terms of its capacity to sustain its sovereignty. That is the most fundamental question. So I published many, oh, maybe 25 years ago, an essay called The Truth About Citizenship. And in that, it is in that essay that I lay out the theoretical principles which underline this conception of the nation state and why it follows from that conception that anybody can be a citizen in any nation. Insofar as it is truly a nation and insofar as it truly embraces principles, particularly of liberty, then no human being is excluded as a potential member of a citizen of that nation. That is the consequence of the emergence of the nation state in combination with the modern principles of freedom. Uh, I, I want to follow up on that. Um, this may surprise you. I'm, I'm not black, but... Um, no, you're non-black. <laughs> <laughs> if I were, and I were, and I were reading that statement, uh, that in a sense, um, that the future of America is, uh, is a sort of gradual mixing and embracing of pale Europeanness. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering whether I wouldn't resent it, because I would be thinking to myself, uh, you know, you're saying that in order to be an American, I have to give up this thing that I identify with and that I cling to and I feel is important because of experience and everything about me is somehow rooted in that history. Um, you know, what would you say to the person, the, the person um, who says, I don't want to give that up? That's a really pertinent observation. It is true, there are people who react that way because their attachment is really uh, visceral. There's no way around that. We have to acknowledge there are some people... I, I, you find this in, in Ibram Kendi. Uh, that, that, that lies at the bottom of his book to a very strong degree. But the, I, the, one of the very first things I ever wrote on this topic in the discussion of multiculturalism pointed out that this attachment to one's so-called identity is itself a mere precious, uh, I don't want to put this in a way that offends, that, that it is a thing that does not have great substance but does have great meaning. <laughs> so, so it is something we cling to as a kind of decoration. Uh, it, it, it is fit for archival purposes but it is not fit for structuring human choices. And the distinction is between what is the basis of the choices we make in this world as opposed to the things that we merely have some fascination with, the decorations that we like to wear. Now, there's nothing wrong with having decorations that we like to wear. There was a phase of the 1960s and 1970s in which wearing dashikas and other forms of tribal dress was very important for black people in the United States. I had some lovely dashikas myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. But to think that that conveys anything about one's sense of agency, one's ability to make choices or to enact transactions in the world, Almost importantly, to exercise political power, authority, or influence, that is a mistake. That will not happen. That only leads to what happened in the 1980s in Minnesota when they actually passed the law in that state that basically tried to create living museums out of ethnic communities where the law was designed to preserve within distinct ethnic communities all of the insignia of their differences 
and to make it a crime to in any way impugn, question, or infringe upon those. And that's just that we're trying to create a living museum. But the problem is when you're dealing with human beings, they can't be kept quite the way animals are in zoos. They're going to break out. <laughs> that's just the way it is. Along the same lines, you uh, um, you write that one of the greatest obstacles, uh, one of the greatest obstacles to absorption, is the quote persistent policy of the government to treat with American blacks uh, as separate and apart. Yes, it is what I call cantonment, trying to create cantons of black people who remain, therefore, within their cantons and are therefore preserved in their blackness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the government policies have tended in that direction ever since the 1960s because the policy makers are faced with a dilemma. If you say people are free to go and come as they see, it's harder to target them with your policies. Your policies need to be general rather than exclusive if people are free to go and come as they please and do as they please. And so if you want to keep a constituency, then you've got to keep it corralled, cantoned, and so our policies have moved in that direction. We're going to draw circles around groups of people so that we can continue to supervise them, direct them, provide for them. Uh, one of the observable trends in the last couple decades, it's probably older than that, but it's much more public uh, recently, is that uh, the uh, uh, the assertion of systemic racism has really broadened into a very, very deep critique of almost everything that is American. Right? Yes. Um, uh, I want to ask you about capitalism in a moment, but, but um, it's broadened into a critique of the founding, obviously, and the principles of the founding. Yes. Right? Not just the practice of the founding, as Frederick Douglass said is bad, but the, the principles of the founding are now themselves bad. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in the person of Kennedy, it's, it's broadened into a critique of the idea of the nation state, mm -hmm. uh, as you said. Uh, and uh, a major theme of this book, as you said in your, in your introductory remarks, is that black Americans would do much better to simply embrace Americanism. Yes. Uh, it's fundamentally. Um, the obstacle to that, of course, is there's this long history of exploitation, <laughs> a long history of uh, inequity, a, a long history of oppressor and oppressed. Mm -hmm. um, um, why should they embrace Americanism, uh, given, uh, given this history of manifest injustice? Well, I don't know if you've, uh, how many people have had the ex autumn experience of trying to work the way through a maze. You know, these huge cornfield mazes and such things that farmers create. Uh, you, the feeling of being lost when you're trying to find your way through that is just overwhelming. Uh, of course, sometimes you can make your way through it, and then sometimes you throw up your hands. Well, what we're describing here is a social maze in which people finding themselves in it, will typically find themselves overwhelmingly oppressed by it. And part of what I'm suggesting is that it is unnecessary. There is not such a, a social maze except imaginatively. For the avenues of escape, if you want to call it that, are plentiful given the nature of contemporary politics and given the opportunities that are available in a highly productive society, in a highly prosperous society. So that one has to persuade oneself that one is in a maze before one can get lost in it. Uh, one could easily pull out a scythe and cut down the corn and escape the corn maze, but one wants to play by the rules. <laughs> so one doesn't cut down the corn stalks and one sort of Fights one way through. Well, there's no reason to do that. Just cut down the corn stalks. Why be oppressed? Why be lost when you don't have to be? When nothing obstructs acting with freedom. Well, that's true socially as well as it is in that metaphorical example that I'm using. And it seems to me that it, one of the important things for us to remember is that this idea of participating in the political system is not an idea of buying into 
but it's an idea of profiting from the opportunities available to oneself. And that's different from just buying into a system, as if to say, unless I embrace, adopt, endorse this system, I am lost. The question is, I face contingencies in life. Well, guess what? Everybody does. Not only human beings, all living beings. Every contingency requires a decision. The question is, what is the most effective decision with the contingencies that we face? Do we go left? Do we go right? At each time, it is important to know that we must make that decision for ourselves. If we concede that we do not get to make that decision, then there's no way we can navigate the contingencies of life effectively. That's the point of this analysis. Picking up on that too, uh, capitalism, uh, it is a very striking thing and it could seem, uh, from the outside, it could seem sort of arbitrary and strange that that's, uh, that uh, the assertion of systemic racism goes with a deep rejection of capitalism, right? I mean, yes. what, it, it's, uh, yes. I mean, yes, there's sort of Marxist tools of analysis of oppressor and oppressed, but you sort of wonder what the deep connection is. Uh, but in, in, the, in the course of your book, you argue that, in fact, this is a, a perverse misunderstanding and that capitalism, if I understand you correctly, is, is capitalism is the best route forward for black Americans, uh, a full-throated embrace of capitalism. Um, let me read the objection to that that you yourself put forward, uh, which is um, uh, the idea that, that uh, there is no political liberty without economic need being taken care of uh, is, is something that has existed at least since Roosevelt, right? So in, in his Commonwealth Club address and his State of the Union message, uh, true and individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not freemen. Uh, certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second bill of rights, a new basis of security and prosperity. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights, the United, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Quote, the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of oneself and one's family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services. Why is that wrong? Let's reflect upon it for a moment. There are two levels to this analysis. One has to level, do with the question of what is capitalism or economic activity. And the other is the question of what does it mean to say that one cannot exercise agency unless one is first placed in a comfortable position? reducing it to its essentials. Well, taking the second question first, if one is established in a comfortable position, what agency does one need to exercise? What's the point of the freedom if one is already granted all of that for which one would exert one's freedom? It seems to be a rather silly argument from that perspective. You say, people can't be free unless they first are well-educated, secure in health, secure in housing, etc., etc. Okay, we grant them all that security, now what are they going to do? Well, nothing in particular. What is there to do? So, it becomes intuitive. One really doesn't have to make an argument that something's missing in that construction. The question is, how do people acquire the opportunity to flourish, save through their own exertions? Flourishing may be understood as something more than merely being comfortable or secure, perhaps. It may be the icing on the cake, perhaps. But what is the motive to seek that icing other than want? And when I use the word want, I'm using it in both senses. The sense of lacking and the sense of desiring. So what undermines desire other than satiety? You don't want what you've got. But you want more of what you've got? Well, people say billionaires never have enough money, so perhaps. But it strikes me that that doesn't quite answer the need of this particular argument. And that brings us back to the first level, the question of what economics itself is. Uh, the idea that there is a distinction between capitalism and socialism as economic systems, I maintain, is fundamentally flawed and wrong. 
all economic transactions are capitalistic. And the only question is the degree of regulation to which they're subject. So in those societies that we call socialist, the regulation is far greater than in those societies we call capitalist. But in all of them, people engage in exchange. And what does exchange require? It requires willing partners. Willing partners must have, reciprocally, something to offer in order to carry out an exchange. That's all capitalism is. It has nothing to do with these exaggerated arguments about oppressive wealth or the systematic scheming to steal from others for the sake of the few in a privileged position. There are people who scheme to steal, yes. They do that in so-called socialist systems, they do it in so-called capitalist systems. But capitalism, socialism, those are just different stages of economic activity, ways in which people carry out economic transactions. So we ask, what is the most efficient way to carry out economic transactions, leaving aside capitalism and socialism? The most efficient way clearly is that in which willing partners to a transaction can achieve mutual advantage. Whatever gives them the opportunity mutually to achieve advantage in the transaction will be the most efficient way to carry out economic activity. Well, to get to that point, to revert now to the second question again, they must have agency. They must have more than a desire for something. They must have the means to acquire it. They must have something to offer in exchange for it. They must have the means to gain, gain something to offer in exchange. All of this individual power, that's what we mean by agency, stands at the foundation. And eroding that foundation serves only to diminish the power and significance of the individual and therefore the opportunity to act with independent authority in economic exchange. So, so I say the argument, and this is a, it is a deliberate argument. The reason it turns against the founding, against capitalism, against Europeanism, is because there is an ideological commitment to overturning established institutions and social practices in pursuit of some more or less utopian vision of human life that excludes the participation of individual human beings in bringing that vision into being. The theory is it must be created for people. People do not create it through their own agency, through their own activity. But for that to be true, then you must say something very important about the creators. For it turns out that while everybody else is impotent, the handful of creators is omnipotent. They can do everything and satisfy everybody while no one else can do anything or satisfy him or herself. That's a flawed vision. We have no reason to assume that there are any such impotent human beings anywhere on the face of the earth. Pardon me, omnipotent human beings anywhere on the face of the earth. They, no matter what office they hold, stand in exactly the same position as all the rest of us. They participate in transactions, and they can do so as willing agents or agents acting under compulsion. The more one acts under compulsion in a transaction, the less free one is, the less fruitful the transaction is going to be. Uh, the family. Uh, uh, I think it's been said by social scientists that there are very few subjects about which social scientists are more in agreement than the huge uh, good social work that families do, uh, and which at the same time is more of a disconnect between what everybody recognizes theoretically and what actually happens practically. Uh, and the state of the black family seems to be a, a, an example of that. Uh, you mentioned earlier, this, is, this, is, uh, this won't be a surprise to readers of Thomas Sowell, but, it's, uh, but, it, but it came as a surprise to me when I first learned it. That, in between the 1890s and, and the 1950s, the black family in America was in very good shape. Yes. Uh, the census data shows that, uh, that the families were together and staying together uh, at least as well 
uh, as white families uh, in the United States. And then starting in the 1950s, something began to happen. Uh, yes. Moynihan famously called attention to it in, in his report on it. Uh, one of the things that has happened uh, since, too, is, is uh, white families are now experiencing something very similar, right? Uh, the, the bottom has really begun to fall out of families across the board. Yes. Um, uh, some of the consequences of that are obviously child poverty, uh, lower college graduation rates, higher incarceration rates, and, and everything else you can name, just huge, huge effects uh, on this. Um, hope, uh, or is this, uh, is this just uh, an irreversible trend and we're likely to be living with the consequences forever? Well, that, that, that's, that's really a wonderful question. Is the trend irreversible? Uh, I, I don't typically engage in prophecies. But this is a case in which I can do at least some retrospective prophecy. By which I need to say that the idea of family formation seems to have powerful presence in humanity prior to and independently of the political forms that have been generated. Which is not to say the families aren't affected by political forms and policies. They are brutally so, as we have now seen. But that somehow people, I would expect, will not lose what they've had from the childhood of the race, which is that instinct to form families. And I point out that the 1890 census revealed most dramatically the extraordinary growth in the black population post-slavery, it more than doubled in scarcely 30 years. And that was a product of that family formation I was talking about previously, that people basically just dove into this idea of building a life, which means starting a family. And I think that is so intrinsic to humankind that it can't be completely eradicated. However, we are living through a time when it has been placed under severe pressure. And it's not so much that people have lost the instinct to build family, but families are being systematically destroyed. Uh, it is perhaps no accident that since the 1950s, and certainly since the 1960s, the kinds of policies and their effect on families in black communities are all counteractive to the desire to sustain a family, beginning with the most obvious so frequently observed when welfare rules were put in place that forced fathers to be separated from homes in order for families needing support to receive support. And so an official policy of creating single parent families followed from that. And of course, at the same time, we saw beginning to emerge the rapid spread of the practice of abortion having legal sanction, coupled with a targeting of abortion facilities in black communities. That is not something that is often, that often receives attention. But if you go around and take out a map, and see where the Planned Parenthood clinics are, you will not fail to observe that they essentially target, especially inner city, black communities. Not only, that's not the only place they are, but that's where they are predominantly, disparately, if, if I may put it in those terms. And so you take the whole convergence of these practices and policies, and you begin to ask yourself, is it surprising that the family has suffered in these contexts? When people are put under such pressures and seductions and influences that they begin making decisions contrary to what their instincts might otherwise have led them to do? It's not surprising to me, nor is it surprising, therefore, that it begins to percolate throughout the whole society. For this is something that is coming now even more strongly into focus for me, which was not present so much in establishing this book. But it is impossible to sustain a system of policy that focuses on one community in the way it is focused on the black community in the United States 
without experiencing the radiating influence of those policies in other communities. Not only do you begin to multiply the numbers of so-called protected groups who begin to clamor for the same kind of attention, but you also require to reinforce the authority of those who implement the policies and practices, and they do that only by expanding the range of that authority. So more and more of the society comes under its influence because of the force of the general application of laws. So I'm not surprised at these consequences, but there was, I'll put it this way, it seems to be reasonable to believe that there must come a time when the system collapses. And that's where the retrospective prophecy comes in. When this system collapses, there will be nothing to fall back on but the instincts that people have had from the childhood of the race. That doesn't sound very cheerful to me. Um, uh, this is the last question, so maybe uh, if the audience uh, would pass your questions to Dr. Watts, uh, and he can collect them, and, uh, and uh, while Dr. Allen is answering this question, I will... Uh, I will if you have any questions, you can just pass your note card. If it's the end of the day, I'll hold it up and I can get it from you. If you need a note card, you can also let me know. I can bring it to you. This, this question is a harder one, and I, I think you touch on it in your discussion of Kendi, which is to say that um, one of the things that's very observable in the way that he speaks and what he says, and you also understand why he's had some of the power that he's had, the effect that he's had, is a clearly religious dimension um, yes. to the appeal. Right? It's spiritual. It's, uh, it has a huge overlap with, with Christianity uh, in the kind of moral language uh, that, it, that it mobilizes and invokes, um, and it appeals to uh, the, the question I want to ask is why has it taken such hold in this country where it has really uh, just gripped and seized people in a way that is that is very much like a um, you know like the great awakening as they say almost in a certain sense it has just it has uh, it has just grabbed people what what is responsible for its purchase uh, I, I will forswear knowledge of the answer to that question. But I'm willing to speculate. Uh, we know how sensitive the issue is. And we know that people are grasping for something in response to it. It may seem often like a grasping at straws, but the need is real. And therefore, whatever seems to feed into that need is going to be received with some avidity. Now, if you couple that with what is a more or less organized propagation of a faith, what you have is people prepared to serve up a meal pre-prepared for a hunger readily identified. And it is embraced, no, no less certainly than the Great Awakening, which you reference, or other uh, fads or waves that sweep through common opinion in a society as open as the United States is. So, so I think one of the things you might conceive is that the anti-racism campaign, and it goes beyond Kendi, but Kendi's become the most visible symbol of it all, is itself an exploitative venture taking advantage of a vulnerability, a huge cultural vulnerability that exists precisely because of a certain anxiety and restlessness about these questions. At the outset, you made reference to the observation that it's dangerous to ask the wrong questions about race in America. And the wrong question is precisely to doubt how pervasive racism is. It is not to doubt the existence of racism, but to doubt its life-determining influence. Anybody who doubts that meets mountains of opposition. And we know that because we are systematically organized, to use the word systemically or systematically properly, in our universities, our corporations, our military, everywhere you look, 
to reinforce a party line view of that question. Now, wherever you have a party line view, particularly in a democratic society, and Alexis de Tocqueville points this out most trenchantly, people are going to have a hard time raising their hands to ask a question about it. Because they don't want to stand out in apparent, how should I say this, opposition, if not even opposition, just athwart what seems to be common opinion. And so once the opinion comes to be embedded, then it has a greater influence than even the number of people who consciously hold it, because others will fear to address it. And that then reinforces its authority. So, so we're living through a time in which people, well, let me illustrate this another way. I'll give you an elaborate account that probably doesn't quite get to what I want you to get out of this. So, so I'm going to give you an illustration, a practical illustration that's real life, that's something that happened to me. When I served on the Commission on Civil Rights, and I was coming to the close of my term, I uh, had occasion to go on to Capitol Hill and address the Wednesday Club. And that's the meeting every Wednesday morning back in those days, in the 1980s, of Republicans on Capitol Hill to give them a statement on the state of black America, or the state of civil rights in the United States. And at the conclusion of my rather lengthy remarks, I explained to them what would be necessary in order to improve things. And the most important thing I had to say to them was, it would be necessary for people to stand up and speak with courage about these questions, to speak the truth, and not to whitewash it. And therefore to call out false explanations at the same time as calling out for stronger legislative and uh, enforcement actions to assure adherence to the law. To a person, and this was essentially the whole Republican caucus in the Congress, on the House of Representatives, not the Senate. Uh, to a person, they said in response to me, we can't say that. We will be called racist. Now, that attitude is what I'm describing when I describe people who themselves not necessarily embracing the common opinion, but nevertheless submit to it, who will not stand out in the face of what they take to be orthodoxy because of their fear of the response it will attract. And I think that's what explains this situation. All right, we have some questions here. Uh, um, uh, economically, who, underline, provides people with the agency, in quotes, you believe they require to make choices? Huh. Who provides people with agency? No one. Oh, no human being. <laughs> Their creator, because that's what it means to be human. Human beings are more than sentient animals responding by instinct. They are willy-nilly confined to acting with reason and therefore making choices and pursuing courses of conduct congruently with those choices approved by their reason. That is agency. It is not given to anyone. It can be obviously interfered with. That's what slavery means. Slavery is an attempt to deny force of will in a human being and substitute the will of another to govern that human being. The denial of the power of slavery is all that is required to sustain the opportunity of agency. <clears throat> 
Do you think that people will in the near future come to realize what the real root of race problems in the nation is? Or will the movement against systemic racism continue to be in the spotlight making no progress? I do think so. I don't know if you all heard it clearly. Do I think that, do I think that the root will eventually be, uh, how was it phrased again? Uh, uh, what the root, well, okay. Do you think that people will, in the near future, come to realize what the real root of race problems in this nation is? Or will the movement against systemic racism continue to be in the spotlight, making no progress? Yeah. I do think they will eventually, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there is a miracle that has happened that no one has paid attention to, but that requires the most careful attention. There has not been a war of racial extinction in the United States. I want you to let that sink in. The most natural human response to the circumstance we have lived through is a war of racial extinction. What such a war looks like, you don't need to go any farther back than Hutus and Tutsis a few years ago, but throughout human history. Or you can ask the lamented souls of Carthage what it means. That is the natural human response to this situation. So much so that Alexis de Tocqueville, at the end of the first volume of Democracy in America, speculated that there will be no solution to the problem of race as regards blacks and non-blacks in the United States other than a war of racial extinction. That was his prediction. And it was a reasonable prediction. In terms of what we know from human history, that is what should have happened. The miracle is that it did not happen. Yes, there were lynchings. I've talked about those. Yes, there were denials of opportunity. There was oppression. All kinds of things happened. All short of any attempt at racial extinction. Whatever there is that led this country to stop short of that harbors the truth about this country's possibilities. I'm sure we will eventually come to see the root of these problems and overcome them. Do you see your prediction of the end of discrete racial cultural groups as threatening America's common law traditions that developed out of a distinct sense of culture, place, and identity in England? I, I, I deny that America's distinct common law tradition, America's common law tradition derived out of a distinct European tradition in those terms. This was a revolutionary society. It was founded on revolutionary principles that jettisoned both the common law and the cultural roots of its formal political organization. It didn't detach from heritage in terms of stemming from Europe, deriving from Europe, we see that most notably in its religion, right? It, it preserved that in the face of casting off all of the aspects of formalized privilege that must be regarded as intrinsic to the European heritage of that day. And as far as the common law is concerned, our courts explicitly abandoned the common law tradition. That's not to say you wouldn't find in state courts some reversion to it. Of course you will from time to time. I mean, habits die hard, and people refer to things even when they become anachronistic. And that certainly has happened a lot in this society. But this was, genuinely was a novus oro seclorum which departed from the old ways of doing things. Most significantly, as the Declaration of Independence makes clear, departed from all adventitious titles of authority to rule. It based everything on the consent of the governed. Everything. And you just cannot overestimate the significance of that 
particular decision. It cast aside all prior ways of doing things for the sake of a grand experiment as they themselves thought to reshape the human experience. And it succeeded. That's one thing that people often fail to reflect upon. And you asked this earlier, Brian, about why the, this whole attitude in the anti-racism campaign in opposition to the founding was so uh, fervent as it has been. And this is where that comes into light. Because those who drive that campaign know that as long as the revolution subsists authoritatively in opinion in this country, they cannot succeed. That, that is their real objective, to overturn the human hopes expressed in the founding of the United States. They're not concerned about whether the founders were slaveholders. They use that as a mere rhetorical <coughs> trope, and they know that it's false, and they know that the majority of those who participated in shaping the Constitution were not slaveholders. They know that some who were slaveholders, nevertheless, came to the conviction that slavery was wrong. They know there were people who signed the Declaration of Independence who, in the throes of revolutionary fervor, had but a handful of slaves, but nevertheless emancipated them. They know the true story. They lie about it. Because they know that if any of those hopes survive, they will fail. If Phyllis Wheatley's patriotism survives, they will fail. If Prince Hall's commitment to liberty survives, they will fail. If Richard Allen's defense of the humanity of black people survives, they will fail. They know that. And so they attack it. But on the other hand, it means we know what it is that is going to produce clarity eventually about the root causes of these problems and the solutions to them. Just one or two questions uh, uh, left maybe. But, um, does Dr. Allen's position amount to an appeal to pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, which is commonly derided as a trope that people appeal to who want to absolve themselves from helping those in need? I have never really understood either what people mean by saying pull yourself up by your bootstraps on the one hand or on the other hand that people in need can't do for themselves. I think both are simplifications without sense. Human beings interact with human beings. Human beings need one another. But they don't depend for their own sense of dignity, self-respect, and expression on being authorized by someone else. That they have intrinsically, internally. If one undertakes a successful exertion, is that pulling one up by one's own bootstrap? No, that's undertaking a successful exertion. Does anybody want to say that no one can undertake successful exertion unless first given a helping hand? Is anybody prepared to say that? Is there no such thing as independent action, as indigenous competence? No, nobody's prepared to say that. It would be insane even to think it. So it's a non-question from that point of view as I see it. Human beings need one another. Human flourishing requires human society. That is not to say that human flourishing is built upon determining human insufficiencies. It's rather built upon seeking mutual opportunities for human advance. The key thing is mutuality, not dependence. Last question. Uh, 
Is the, nation's, is the nation state a valid structure of power in all cases? Isn't the US large to the point where economic value and geographic diversity makes singular rule by one institution difficult, if not impossible, especially compared to European nations where this is not the case to nearly the same extent? Could you read that again? <laughs> is the nation state a valid structure of power in all cases? Isn't the US large to the point where economic value and geographic diversity makes singular rule by one institution difficult, if not possible, uh, especially compared to European nations where this is not the case to nearly the same extent? Oh, that, that is so packed. I don't think there's a great deal of difference between the European nations and the United States with respect to the exercise of power. There's certainly a difference with respect to the amplitude because the United States is a much greater, much richer society than those in Europe. But otherwise, I don't see a distinction there. Uh, with regard to the question, is the United States too complicated for this analysis? That's how I'm interpreting the question. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You see, when you ask, is the nation state the only alternative, the question is, what other option is there? Uh, what, what system of human exchange can replace that in the modern world? And I can't think of any that would suffice. Remember, what we're talking about is the exercise of sovereignty. When we talk about principles, for example, of international law, those principles are understood exclusively in terms of the relations among states. Yes, I know. Some people would like to try to derive various notions of indigenous authority or tribal authority and to give it a place in the pantheon of international law. But those are mainly fetishes. Uh, and they, they serve the interests of people who like to cultivate fetishes, but they don't have any substantial reality. The reality is what's happening on the ground on, in the name of sovereignty and behind the authority of arms. Now, what that means, of course, is that the power we're talking about is not a mere textual power, but the real power in politics. And we mustn't forget that not only did we get the emergence of the nation state as the bearer of that power, but once the nation state emerged as the bearer of power, the next transition to take place in the world was the discovery of the necessity to restrain power. I'm not going to go into that whole development at this moment, but there's a connection with all these things. And the reason we have constitutionalism is because we got the nation state and then realized we had to find a way to restrain power in order to have it and not make it oppressive. And that produced constitutionalism in the manner that we know it, and not merely in a mythical fashion, such as we attach to the Magna Carta. So, what we're talking about is power restrained to be exercised only through certain carefully crafted institutions in a framework that creates frequent and numerous opportunities for escape. That's the European system we're talking about. That's the reality, politically, socially, and culturally.